about Christ who laid down his life. I'm so thankful for all those who have laid down their life so we could be here and worship together. Um, I want to start with just a quick story. Uh, I was recently on a trip. My wife extended her trip to hang out with uh, some friends that we have, and they're all like serious foodies. And they happen to be in the little city of Prague, and they uh, went to Airbnb and signed up for an Airbnb experience, the taste of Prague. And it was going to be this. So they go to a really nice restaurant, and they have an appetizer. And then they go to the next restaurant, and they get like a main dish. And then they go to the next restaurant, and they get a dessert. And then they round off the evening with a tasting of like local Prague beers. And that was going to be the plan. And they pay for this all. They've got a group of like six people, and then the guide is going to come meet them at this restaurant. And they show up at the restaurant, and the place is absolutely packed, and the guide isn't there. And like 10 minutes later, the guide walks up, and he's a college student, and uh, he's like, whoa, I've never seen it this busy before. Let me see if they can find you a table. Apparently, he didn't really make a reservation or anything. No table was available, so they move on to the place they're going to have dinner. They'll just have their appetizer there, and they show up, and he's like, same thing happened. I can't believe they don't have a, a spot for you guys. Well, I'll take you to my favorite cafe. So they go to this cafe, and he's talking about how cool the art is on the walls. We've moved past the food section at this point. Um, and he, he says, well, they do have a little menu here, and so he orders like three entrees for these seven people sitting at the table. And now uh, my wife's like super hangry, which is not pretty. Her sister is even worse at this moment. And so they start calling over the waitress and like adding food to the order. And, and you can see this college student's eyes getting bigger and bigger because he's going to have to pay the tab because they paid for this experience. And then he says, you know what, let's just do the beer tasting here. And he asks the waitress what beers they have on tap there. And they have Stella, which you can get here. <laughs> and a local beer. And so they all have the local beer, and then they go on to the place where they were going to have dessert, and it's closed. That was the end of the Airbnb experience. They're still fighting for their money back. Uh, we don't always get what we are promised or expect in life, do we? We learn to be a little bit skeptical. Um, I'm not allowed to talk to salespeople because I like people too much, so my wife has to do that now. Uh, apparently, I don't have enough skepticism in me to navigate that situation very well, but uh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, I think it's actually good to be skeptical. Like, skeptical is a good way to be because if you're skeptical, you're still open to something. Like, if you're convinced that this is a legit deal or that there's, there's some weight behind it, that there's some substance here, uh, you might be in. But you're not just going to, like take every rumor as truth. You want to check out the facts. Uh, when you're a doubter, you just refuse to believe anything. You're like, no one can know anything because there's never enough proof. And uh, if you're a cynic, you just assume the worst of every situation so you're never disappointed. Um, I like being skeptical. And we live in a very skeptical environment. We live in a skeptical environment when it comes to God. Um, we live in a place that religiously is termed the nun zone. And this is because in the early 2000s, they did this survey, and they asked people, what religious group are you affiliated with? Like, is there a church that you go to or a mosque that you go to? And 63% uh, of the people polled said none. I have no affiliation to any particular religious group. Uh, this is compared with the rest of the country at around 40%. So we're like 25% higher in the nun zone. We just don't affiliate with institutions. So, uh, and then 25% uh, of the people said they don't have a particular religion. So it's not even just a group. Like 25% of the people said they don't have a religion. And so this made a bunch of people think, oh, the Northwest is losing its faith. Everyone's becoming atheist. But it's not because nearly 70% of the people said they still believe in God. That's crazy. So people aren't connected to an institution. They don't have a particular religion, but they totally believe God is out there. They're just not convinced that they're going to find it by coming into a church or that it's necessarily tied to this guy, Jesus. Um, as I thought about that, as I've been uh, trying to process that, the kicker is that in my life, at times, I'm not all that different. I'm a really a mix of faith and doubt in my life. Uh, situations come up 
where I get caught up in the emotions of it and I go, man, why isn't God doing something about that? And I find myself going, well, I know God's good and I know God is present and I know he has a plan, but I'm not feeling that right now. It's not showing up and so I'm a little bit confused. Uh, I have these moments where I'm a mix. I'm going to share an old one and then a new one for you. Uh, an old one, I had started this little church, and it sprung up in our house. We uh, opened up our very first service, and 52 people showed up in my living room. <laughs> they were all squished in there, and there were people sitting on the stairs, and people were trying to look at something I was projecting on the wall, and their necks were all cricked, and people are like rubbing their necks. It, was, uh, it quickly became the size of my living room, which was like 22 people. And for the next couple years, it was 22 people. No one was coming, and Christina and I worked harder and harder, and eventually we got so burned out that we're like, man, why isn't God doing something? We're done. We shut the door on the church. In that moment, I was really, really trying to figure out, did I just mishear God? Because I know God's good, but I don't see him at work as a mix of this faith and this doubt at the same time. Um, Current one, reading a news story about the immigration crisis and and how they shut down one of the detention centers because there's the flu spreading out in it. And I'm like, why won't God do something? Because it just doesn't seem right that all these people are sick and that the elderly and the little kids are getting sick and people have passed away. That just is messed up. There's stuff out there in the world that we look at and we go, man, God, where are you? And yet... I've experienced God moving in my life and in the lives of other people so many times that I know he's absolutely real and he's doing things. So I end up in this spot where I'm skeptical about what God can and will do. And in this moment, as uh, I wrestle with my skepticism, I find I need to spend some time with the patron saint of all skeptics, a guy by the name of Thomas. And I want to just read his account for you. I've been preaching through Easter texts like after Jesus rose from the dead. And here was Thomas's experience of that event. This is uh, John 20, 24 through 31. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I can put my finger where those nails were, Unless I can put my hand into his side where a spear had come in and and pierced his heart, I'm not going to believe that. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told them, Because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Let's pray. God, Thank you that you are present and that you are real. We don't always see you, though. And so we end up with Thomas in these moments of skepticism. So speak to us, guide us, uh, work with the stuff that's going on in our lives. Uh, Let your Holy Spirit inspire what we need to hear. We love you. Amen. So these disciples had traveled around with Jesus for three years. They had seen him do 35 recorded miracles. John tells us there was many more. They had experienced his divine teaching and go, whoa, that's different than some of the other stuff I've heard, and yet it it rings really true. It's really beautiful. They had experienced his love and his character as he worked with different people and as he worked with them. They'd believed. They'd become convinced that Jesus was God and that he was coming to power. And as he rose to power, he got killed. He got crucified. The most disappointing ending to this movement that they had become a part of. And now they are fearing for their lives, huddled in an upper room, and Jesus comes to them. 
And he eats with them, and that's not something ghosts do. He eats with them, and he talks to them, and they're like, dude, he is right here in front of us, but we saw him die, but he's not in the tomb. This is crazy. We have to let Thomas know, because Thomas wasn't with him. Where was Thomas, by the way? Uh, Thomas, I'm pretty sure, just wanted to be alone. You know? Great disappointment enters his life. He doesn't know what to do next. He's going to try and sort that out, and he is bummed. And I don't know if you've ever been in a tough spot, but one of the first things that I want to do is to go be alone. I don't want to be around a bunch of happy people. Uh, I go hide in my cave, and thankfully I have friends who now go find me while I'm in my cave and go, Chris, we're leaving, let's go. Um, Thomas is hiding out, and his friends go, dude, you have got to see this. Jesus is in our midst. And... uh, And he says, and he hears something that he goes, I don't know, that's crazy. Jesus is alive, never seen anybody rise from the dead. Uh, When I closed that church, the well that I had planted, I remember I went and visited a good friend of mine, and we were talking about all that, and and she kind of pulled me aside at the end of our visit when I was about to hop into my car, and she goes, Chris, I want you to know that God is for you and that he loves you, and he's not toying with your life. Here's the crazy thing. In that moment, I knew she was speaking the absolute truth about God. I also wasn't ready to feel that yet. I still had the cloud. I couldn't quite shake it. I was in the midst of this experience that did not resonate with what she was saying. And I'm going, I know you're right, but I can't quite bring myself to believe that fully. Um, Did any of you see the Avengers movie? Some, a few of you. I think it's been out long enough that at least the box office says you all went four times. I'm not going to ruin the movie. I promise I will not spoil it. But I want to share one little tiny scene from it with you. Uh, we're not cool enough at my church to put up videos, so I'm just going to put up a picture for you. Uh, one of the heroes of the Avengers movies is a guy named Hawkeye. And he's kind of got this great character, and he's always doing good. And and in a moment, he loses his entire family. And he's grief-stricken. And he becomes a different character by the name of Ronan, who is just dark. He is just going out and killing bad guys at a rapid pace, and it's not pretty. And uh, his friend comes to him and says, there's a way that we can fix this. I want you to be part of the team. And he says something really striking. Here's what he says. Don't give me hope. Don't even give me that hope. I'm skeptical because hoping I've been disappointed before. I think we live in a culture that feels that way about institutional church sometimes. They have encountered disappointment. And frankly, what we're offering is is pretty crazy when you really think about it. Like, I'm just going to take a step back out of my pastor's shoes just for like one tiny moment. And I'm going to imagine that I am somebody who has not grown up in the church. I've never come to faith. And somebody comes to me and here's what they say. Jesus, this revered person who I'm like, yeah, I've totally heard of him. He seems to be like an important religious figure. Well, um, when he died, he is offering to take away all of your sins and give you a fresh new relationship with God uh, and clean your slate with God. Okay, that's weird. But next, next, he actually didn't stay dead. Because of God's power, he rose from the dead, and now he's alive. And he wants to move into your life. He wants to, like, cohabitate in my body and spirit and soul like he's renting an apartment with me and we're going to be roomies. And through him being my roomie, he's going to change the way that I view life. He's going to transform who I am so that I can have a life that I could have never made on my own so that he can have his impact in the world and change the world as a whole through a whole bunch of us doing that. That is the Christian faith, which seems absolutely nuts to me, except that's what I've experienced. Like, that is real to me because I remember walking around with a heavy conscience, and I remember asking God to forgive my sins, and I remember feeling like luggage just got taken out of my backpack, and now I'm fresh and I'm light, and I'm like, man, this is cool. Joy, I don't remember what that felt like, but this is it. I like it. 
And I've seen that happen for other people as well. So then it starts to become real. It was experienced. I've seen the Lord. Thomas's response is absolutely legit, though. He says, verse 25, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my finger where those nails were, unless I can put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to take your word for it. I have to experience it myself. And therein lies a very interesting spot. Because people will be convinced that Jesus is real if they can experience him, if they can see him, if they can touch him, if they can actually get something to grab a hold of besides more than a bunch of words. How I came to faith, in part, was I was hanging around this church, and this pastor invited me to come to lunch at his house, and they talked about a bunch of stuff that went over my head, but it was all very, very real. Like, he was a legit, honest person. And then he would drive me home, and the whole way I'd pepper him with questions about the faith. Like all of my intellectual reasons why I wouldn't believe in Jesus before that. Funny thing is, I don't remember any of his answers. Not a single one of them can I like recite for you, because it wasn't an intellectual problem. But instead, I encountered a whole bunch of people who loved me and accepted me. And then I began to think, well, maybe there is something to this. And then I read the Gospels. And I pushed on those a little bit, and I realized that they have some weight to them. The reality is, it's not just a bunch of words, and it's not just a moral statement about these are our ethics. The reality is, I experienced the love of God through a bunch of people who I didn't think would give that to me. They shouldn't have. It didn't make any sense that they would. And that made Jesus real for me. If you think through your own faith life, What have you experienced? Who has impacted your faith? My guess is there's a string of people along the way who have helped shape your perspective of God, much more so than just a bunch of words on a page. I believe that the Christian faith was designed to be experienced. It was designed to be wrapped in flesh, that God had to be made real, and that's why Jesus came. 33 years of life, Jesus as a baby, Jesus as a young man, Jesus walking around with his disciples, the way he died, the way he appeared to them afterwards, it was always God wrapped in flesh, and that's how we know who God is. We have to experience it. When Thomas experienced it, his response was the highest point of faith that anybody can give. He says, Jesus, you're my Lord and my God. He doesn't say, Jesus, you are the Lord. He says, Jesus, you're my Lord. I am putting you in charge of my life, and you are God. Nobody had said that up until that point, as far as I can find. My Lord and my God, everything I have is yours. I'm all in. Thomas was that kind of guy. He's skeptical, but once he found something, he was willing to put his weight down on it. Um, In John chapter 11, Lazarus has gotten sick. Lazarus uh, is getting sicker, and Lazarus dies while Jesus is away great disappointment. And uh, then Jesus goes, let's go over there. And uh, he's going to live again. And all the disciples go, no, let's let him sleep. This is not a good idea. There's a bunch of people in Jerusalem that are trying to kill you, and that's about three miles away. Let's not go. Let's go heal somebody else somewhere far away from Jerusalem, and then we can keep doing this. And uh, Thomas speaks up and goes, you know what? If Jesus wants to go over there and die... I want to die with him. I'm in. What Thomas did after the Gospels, according to church history, as well as uh, what we find in, in India, is that he went to East India, brought the faith, he lived it out, he shared the Gospel, people came to faith, and then he died a martyr there. He was completely all in. He had found something of substance. He had found it, by the fact that Jesus had appeared to him and said, you can touch me, you can experience this. How that happens for us, well, Jesus hints at it. Verse 29, because you have seen me, you have believed, Thomas, but blessed are those who have not seen me and yet will believe. I don't think that means that we just have blind faith about Jesus. What it means is that we don't get to see Jesus 
in person. I haven't met anyone who came to faith by interacting with the punctured Jesus. <laughs> Not, none of you, I believe, have hung out with Jesus punctured uh, and put your hands in his holes or anything like that. But what you did do was you saw something that was convincing and you have experienced God. Remember that whole bit about Jesus sending his spirit to be inside of us and cohabitate with us? That's how God does it. The funny thing is people don't resonate uh, with the Christian ethic. I don't know one person who's come to faith because somebody laid out the Christian ethic and thought, that's really, really a good way to live. I'm totally all on board with Jesus. I've, had, I've actually talked to atheists who were like, I think that's a really good way to live. I like the Christian ethic. But they didn't put their faith in Jesus. Um, the public image of Jesus is not always good in our, our country. It's sort of a mess. It, it looks like this like exclusive, elitist group that likes to put its uh, plans and its, its ethics and all of that on everyone else. It's not a great image, but it doesn't bother me so much. And here's the reason why. When you experience something, it's usually more powerful than the rumor that you heard. I grew up in Southern California, a little town in Ventura. We had absolutely no African-American population. And uh, then I moved from this little sheltered bubble, and I went to high school at Garfield High School. <laughs> I was small. It was like the time of mandatory busing, so there was all this racial tension. And uh, it freaked me out. But then I met some really, really, really cool African-American people. And I'm like, oh. They're not all scary. Actually, some of them are really, really cool. Okay, now I can set aside that prejudice because I've experienced something different. The reality is in our faith, I have experienced people living out who Jesus is to me again and again and again. That pastor I told you about, when my dad passed, it was another tough time for me, and, and I was struggling with who God is and why he would allow my dad, who tried to be healthy his whole life, die super early of cancer, it felt like. And there was a men's group here at Brookview that just took me in. I don't think any of them made me their like, pet care project, like we're going to nurse Chris's faith through this. But they loved me, and they took me in, and they were there for me. Uh, and it was a powerful experience of who God was. When I... Uh, didn't think I had anything left in me to offer as a pastor. Uh, Jason took me in. John Westfall took me in where I'm now serving. People uh, took me in. Even like little moments. Like I remember this one moment where I was, I was here, I was actually guest preaching. And, um, and I, I, I secretly like inside was like super pessimistic about people. I'm like the only reason people do anything for anybody else is because they can get something out of them. And I shared in that sermon how I needed to take down Christmas lights or something. And then you came up to me and offered me to get a bunch of youth together and help me take down my Christmas lights. And I'm like, what are they going to get out of it? What are they going to get out of it? A little crack popped up in my skeptic perspective of why people do things. As we live out our lives with God... As we interact with Jesus, as we walk with Jesus, he does come and live inside in us, and he shapes us to be more and more like himself. And as we become more and more like him, admittedly with our flaws, somehow we become conductors of his energy to the world. And when you're a good conductor, when you're something like him, so if you take a little metal wire and then you attach another metal wire to it, electricity can keep on going. But if we look incredibly different like if we're something that doesn't at all look like Jesus, it doesn't conduct very well. And then people go, see, there's nothing to that. I'm ex you say that God is super loving and he cares about me, and yet I'm not seeing that in the way that I'm being treated. It's like electricity was going down the wire and then it hit something that was just wood and it just ground to a halt. Um, we have the opportunity to be Jesus to people, to bring life. That's what uh, verse 30 says. Jesus did many other miracles in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded, but these were written down. These experiences were written down so that you could believe in Jesus 
the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. This abundant, divine-inspired, cohabited life where God influences who you are, what you experience, and the world through you can be people's. And it happens through you and through me with what we say and what we do. The opposite can also be true. Um, I was having dinner this week with my mom and a friend of hers, and we were sitting there, and they asked me what I do for a living, which I'm super nervous about asking, about answering. I want like a side gig so that I can just say that because I'm tired of this experience. As a pastor, here's what you get. You, you say you're a pastor and then the conversation either grinds to a halt like instantly. <laughs> or you get somebody's religious experience. Which is really weird when you're like not working and you don't want to like be working because you're just working. Um, but this guy is sitting there at the table, and I tell him I'm a pastor, and he goes, you know, I went to church for a while. And it was this... <laughs> you could go again. That's, but, um, I went to church for a while, and uh, it was this church, and it was, it was mostly... And he, this is a, a Hispanic guy, and he's like, it was mostly a bunch of old white people. And I'm like, yeah, I know those churches. <laughs> um, and he said it was, it was, they were pretty cool. I liked being around them. And then uh, there was this, this guy who was going to, I couldn't tell if it was become a member or become in leadership or something. And there was this big hubbub about it because he was uh, East Indian. And that was when I stopped going. And I was like, ooh, he experienced prejudice in the church. I, get, I totally get it. These people say that they're this. But what I experienced was that. So I'm out. Um, at which point my mom spoke up. She's not a person of, of faith yet. Well, she is a person of faith, but not Christian faith. Uh, and she spoke up and goes, yeah, that's one of the reasons that I don't go to church. And that and they always ask me for money, which I, my mom, I don't think, has gone to church for a while. And I don't know which church it was that asked her for money. Uh, but this experience is what she now ties to what Christianity is. It's fascinating to me. The experience that we have of what it means to be a Christian is all about who we're interacting with, how we experience it, and that will either lend credibility to the words of Scripture or it'll take it away. We have an incredible opportunity. Bring people life by sharing Jesus with them, mostly in the things that we do and in the way that we interact with them. And we have the really scary responsibility, and uh, we find it, I know I did this out of order, I'm sorry, screen people. Uh, we find it in 2 Corinthians, I want to put it up on the screen here. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So we implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You're an ambassador. You are the representative of God, and God is trying to love the world and give it life, and he does it right through you. It is honestly one of the coolest adventures. It is the, the, the most incredible purpose that we can have. Like, I have another side gig. I'm so excited to say I have a side gig. <laughs> that means I can use something besides being a pastor as, like, what I do so that the conversation doesn't always grind to a halt. I have a side gig now, and um, I work at a winery, and I work in their tasting room, and so I get to like hang out with people on a totally different level than I do as a pastor. Um, when I go there, how they experience me interacting with them will either give life to them, or it'll stop it. And then people will ask me what else I do, and then I say I'm a pastor in the conversation. But... <laughs> The point is, they also, at some point as we walk together, will probably find out about my faith, and they will see a little bit of, hopefully, who Jesus is. Jesus is like this, uh, Christine and I have art that doesn't fit on our wall right now, and so we tucked it into a closet, and right now it's totally covered over with dust. And I think that there's a bunch of people out there in the world who are like, who is this Jesus guy? I didn't grow up with him in the church. 
And I'm trying to figure out how he fits into this whole God thing that I totally believe exists. And we have the opportunity to pull out that picture and through our lives and through our love, wipe a little bit of that dust off, a little bit of the dirt off and go, well, here's at least part of it. And as they interact with more and more people, they're going to see who God is. And then God can give them life. But the only way that happens is through the Holy Spirit being with us. And so I want to end my sermon by praying for you and for me.